My name is Erin Warzala, and I am the branch, Assistant Branch Manager of the DuPont Library, and I will be tonight's host. This program is being recorded for future viewing on YouTube, so in order to improve the quality of everyone's listening experience, your microphones have been muted. If you have a question or comment, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. We will use chat to facilitate a question and answer session at the end of the program. The purpose of this program is to present topics of interest and research information to the residents of Allen County and to provide a platform for the University of St. Francis faculty members to share their passion for their subjects with the library patrons. And now I'd like to introduce Stacy Lehman and Jennifer Richard from the University of St. Francis. Both Stacy and Jennifer are registered nurses and have a Master's of Science in Nursing. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Is there anything more about your background that you would like to share? Sure. I'm Stacy. I have my baccalaureate and my master's degree, both from the university, Ball State University, and I've been working um, in the pediatric ICU since I graduated in 2015. I started at Riley Hospital for Children in Indianapolis, and now I work here at Lutheran in the pediatric ICU. I also teach child health nursing, which is the pediatric nursing course in both the ASN and the BSN program levels and I've been doing that for about two years. Um, this topic's important to me because I'm really passionate about overall child health and empowering families and how they can promote their children's health and prevent health problems in the future. All right, I'm Jennifer and I have been a nurse for 28 years. I have a bachelor's and master's both from St. Francis. And uh, in addition, um, in 2020, I finished a post-master's in uh, pediatric clinical nurse specialist. Um, I've worked in both pediatrics and neonatal intensive care over the years and been a nurse educator at St. Francis for the past 17 years. Um, this topic is something I looked at in my initial uh, master's program back in 2006. And, um, and as you'll see today, this problem's only gotten worse in, uh, in the last seven, 17, no. I can't do the math right now. <laughs> I can't either. In the last several years. In the last several years, yeah. So, um, so another thing I've noticed too is over the time in uh, as a nurse and as a parent uh, that this topic isn't always uh, addressed that well with healthcare providers. Um, not always do does that nurse or that physician want to address that uh, childhood um, obesity or that overweight child. And so we're just hoping to hit on this topic um, today and give you more information. So before we get into the data and the trends um, and the rest of our, our presentation, we want to look at some definitions. And so we're going to talk about childhood obesity mainly today, but we also have the category of overweight as well. And so when we talk about this with kids, we use the measurement of the BMI, which is the body mass index. This is just a measurement, it's a, it's a weight to height ratio. And uh, in adults, a normal BMI is 18.5 to 24.9. But with kids, it doesn't always really work that way. So we actually plot them on a growth chart, just like we plot height and weight. And so BMI is, started, um, is measured starting at the age of two. And so um, if you have a child and you're going to, the, to your, um, yearly physical exams, they'll get their height, their weight, and then they'll plot that BMI. And so at the 85th percentile is where we start to identify overweight in children. And then when a child hits the 95th percentile, that gets us into the obese category. There is actually a severe obesity category that, that starts at the 125th percentile. Um, so that's just, so now we understand how we're categorizing this problem. Um, in 2018 is the last uh, data that the CDC has on the obesity rates. So we're hoping to see some more updated data soon. But at that time, 19.3% of children in the US were uh, obese. So one in, about one in five were obese at that time. And we can look at this uh, table here and see this trajectory since uh, 1963 is where this uh, table starts and uh, takes us up to 2018. So you can see this line's been just kind of, uh, just in a straight line up. What we know in the data that we have 
um, through the pandemic is that that rate, that line is now headed up at, a, at double the rate it had been. So it's a worsening problem. And we're gonna talk about some of those factors in just a bit here. Um, let's see, so we have the 19.3% uh, in 2018. In 2018 also we had 16% of kids were overweight. So that's about 35% of our US kids are overweight or obese. So, and about 6.1% of kids were in that severe obesity category. Um, so other things to think about too is why early in intervention is important. We, there was a study that looked at uh, overweight and obese kids in kindergarten and that really their risk of being obese at eighth grade was just went up as, as the bigger the child was going into kindergarten. So like um, if they were mildly obese in kindergarten, about half of them remained obese in eighth grade. Um, if they were severely obese in kindergarten, 70% were obese again in eighth grade. Um, in the pandemic, the, the percentages we're looking at right now are anywhere from 20 to 26% of our uh, population of kids are in that obese category. Um, we also know obese kids that have an obese parent, those uh, risks are higher that uh, they will remain obese as adults. So why do we care? Why is this important? Um, for one, it's obesity in adults. So we know all these risk factors for obesity in kids leads to obesity in adults. We know obesity is a risk factor for so many diseases. Um, obesity, that body fat, extra body fat causes inflammation and that contributes to uh, heart disease, cancer, metabolic abnormalities like diabetes and a decreased immune response. It also decrease, or increases the severity of infections. We're seeing that with our COVID patients. Um, kids and kids that were obese it's, um, up through adolescence, even if they lose that weight as an adult or at the end of adolescence, they're still at an 80% higher risk of developing diabetes. Um, we also are seeing obesity in kids at a higher rate in our um, more vulnerable populations and our uh, racial and ethnic groups. And um, so we see this disparity uh, with this problem as well. And another thing, economic, it definitely has economic impact Parents of obese kids miss work more. These kids miss school more. It puts them more at a disadvantage academically as well. So now Stacy's gonna talk about some of the contributing factors. So we'll talk about some of these factors that are contributing to the risk of children being obese. Um, the first we'll start with is environmental factors. So we know that foods that are available to children right now are being made with more sugar. They're served in larger portion sizes and fast food advertisement is kind of changing the way we view meals. Uh, less families at this time are sitting down and eating together. They're missing that critical opportunity for caregivers to kind of model healthy eating behaviors to children. Also the changes in our physical environment, like more TVs in the home and unsafe sidewalks are encouraging kids to reduce their physical activity and replace it with sedentary activities like television watching and video games. Uh, we actually know that television viewing is one of the best established environmental influences on the development of ch obesity during childhood. Many children, especially in densely populated cities, are missing out on those safe spaces to play outdoors. So they're limited to what kind of physical activity they can perform in their home. We also know that genetic factors put our kids at risk for being obese. More and more research is being done and we're actually finding that during infant development, there are critical time periods in which a baby in utero is more susceptible to environmental and nutritional influences. These influences, if negative, can play a role in increasing the risk of the child developing obesity later in life. For this reason, it's really important that pregnant women participate in routine prenatal care and ask their OBGYN about appropriate weight gain and nutritional, gain, nutritional choices in each stage of her pregnancy. In addition, the gestational screenings of blood pressure and weight and glucose are important, especially during those critical periods of development. The COVID-19 pandemic affected our lives in a variety of ways, one of which was it increased the poor outcomes related to children and weight gain. 
Overall, throughout the pandemic, children had reduced physical activity due to missing extracurricular activities like after-school sports programs, as well as the lack of formal physical education programs when, classes, when schools were closed and classes went virtual. During the pandemic, that caused a lot of children to rely more on screen time, both for e-learning and for recreational use because a lot of places were closed and kids were quarantined at home, so they relied on their screens for entertainment. One study actually showed that some children increased their screen time by five hours or more during the pandemic. So this increase of screen time recreational, recreationally a lot of times was through the use of social media. And we know that though it can be beneficial, it connects kids to each other, um, that increased social media use also connected them to these unrealistic body images and it increased the rates of kids being bullied due to weight issues. Um, that bullying actually causes further weight gain because kids turn to eating as a coping mechanism. So the more kids were viewing screens, the more likely they were to be exposed to advertisements for fast foods, foods that are high in salt and fat and sugar, and they craved those foods and wanted those foods more because they were exposed to those advertisements. Home quarantine and virtual learning also increase children's access to food at home. Um, food throughout the day, snacks throughout the day, often which are higher in carbohydrates and lower in nutritional value than when they're in the classroom and learning. So with these school closures, um, we also lost a lot of healthy breakfast and lunch options for children who were utilizing those services during, before the pandemic. Then in addition to that, during the pandemic, a lot of families suffered job losses and furloughs all while food prices continue to increase. So a lot of families had to rely on shelf-stable foods, which are more highly processed and generally lower in nutritional value. Finally, the pandemic brought about increased stress in both children and adults, and lots of studies found that prolonged exposure to toxic levels of stress increased the risk for obesity and poor health outcomes. This loss of jobs that I mentioned before also caused a lot of families to lose insurance. So a lot of kids were missing out on those screening opportunities um, with the loss of insurance. We couldn't measure their weight as frequently or track some of these important lab values. Then add in a school being closed and they no longer got these, these school-based opportunities for health screenings and that caused a lot of problems for our kids and their health throughout the pandemic. So what can families do at home? What can we do to help prevent this problem? What can we do to prevent our children from becoming obese? Uh, the very first thing to consider is early screening. The National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners stated that they are committed to promoting healthy eating and active lifestyles for children and families to establish a foundation for optimal health across the lifespan. Early identification of accelerated weight gain and overweight and obesity is key to prevention and treatment. For this reason, the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners recommends the BMI screening that Jennifer talked about starting at age two and blood pressure screening starting at age three. These screenings are typically completed during those well-child appointments, like we mentioned, so it's important to attend those appointments regularly and to communicate with the physician or the provider if you're concerned about child's weight gain. Both local health systems have stated that um, if you're concerned about your child's weight, your primary care physician or a pediatrician can actually make a referral to a registered dietitian who can give you even more tools and resources to help get your child's weight back on track. All right, next let's talk about nutrition. So nutrition is gonna start early, like we keep emphasizing early screening, early identification, early intervention. So with nutrition, actually we start as early as that prenatal period. So um, we want moms, pregnant moms, to be um, eating those nutritious, well-balanced diets. Um, we want to support breastfeeding in, for that first full year because that's gonna be the best nutrition um, in that first year of life. As we move on, we um, can look at portion sizes for our kids. And this is really important. We, ha we have such big dinner plates these days. They're beautiful plates and all, but when you think of you know, a three or four year old looking at this massive plate and an adult size serving on it, it can be a little overwhelming. And so when we're trying to get kids to make good choices, we need to put the right amounts of food in front of them and, and make it visually appealing. So, this table, I don't know if you can read it, but um, goes through each of the, uh, the food groups and uh, gives you the appropriate sizes. So when we look at fruits for 
uh, ages one to three and four to six, it's just a quarter cup of um, cooked, frozen or canned uh, fruit for that age group, or a half a piece of fruit, so a half an apple or a half a banana. And then we get to age seven to 10, we get to a half a cup of those uh, frozen or cooked or canned um, fruits. Vegetables are very similar uh, sizes as well, quarter cup uh, cooked. If you don't know what these sizes look like, you know, go ahead and get out those measuring cups and actually measure those out to, and, and try to use um, plates. You know, you can get those individual um, little sectioned off plates that can help with serving sizes for kids. Can make it a lot of fun too. Um, and have kids pick, pick those, uh, help them pick the foods. We also um, want to think about growth related calorie needs. We see a huge amount of growth in the first year of a child's life. And then again, in adolescence, there's this really large growth spurt. But in between, we see this nice steady growth. And so we want to be thinking about that and what are the, uh, the appropriate needs uh, for that child. Sugar. We want to limit sugar. So sorry, uh, all of you candy lovers, which I am myself. <laughs> but, but there's so many bad things we know about sugar now, which I just hate to say, but um, especially those sugar-sweetened beverages. It's just empty calories. Um, they don't even really fill us up. They go through us very quickly, uh, but it's just a lot of empty calories. So we can do things like really um, find ways of making water more attractive to kids. Get, get a special cup for them. We can maybe add a little bit of fruit juice, um, real diluted and work them up to just straight water or get them involved in cutting up fruits and adding that to the water, making it pretty, making it um, add a little flavor to it, that kind of thing. Um, we wanna think about family-based uh, nutrition too. So, you know, the whole family should be eating uh, you know, this balanced diet with whole grains, fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, limiting those saturated fats as much as possible. So um, if we can be, as a family, making those choices, it's, you know, it's no longer the do as I say, not as I do, but, but we should all be making those. And as parents, we are really, um, parents and caregivers, we're the role models uh, for, for our children and, and they're learning so much at those uh, family dinner times too. Also want to limit the fast food if possible. There's not a lot of great choices um, in fast food, although they certainly do have some. So if you are forced to make those fast food trips, I know that life is really busy and crazy right now, um, and we are all busier than, than we've probably ever been. You know, we try to make those, those uh, healthier choices. Okay, I think that moves us on to physical activity. So in addition to paying attention to our nutrition, looking at our physical activity, we know that physical activity improves our energy levels, decreases stress, improves body image, and helps maintain a healthy weight. So I think that addresses most of the contributing factors that I mentioned about childhood obesity. These are ways that we can help reduce those risk factors so we can hopefully prevent this childhood obesity. Children actually should aim for at least 60 minutes of physical activity a day, most of which is obtained through play. So most of the time kids don't actually have to do any additional working out throughout their day. They get their 60 minutes of play. Um, if they're walking to school, that could be a 20 minute walk to school, plus you know 10 minutes of playing around before school starts, maybe jumping rope, walking around, talking with their friends. Add in 30 minutes of playing at recess and that's a total of 60 minutes. So there wasn't any additional working out that the child was forced to do. They were able to get their 60 minutes of physical activity through play. If children aren't used to that, that kind of activity, um, you can start really small, start at 20 minutes a day and work your way up to 60 minutes a day. Um, we can also split up that 60 minutes throughout the day where they get 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, 20 minutes in the evening. It's really important that caregivers set these realistic goals, um, really track the progress at obtaining these goals and make it visual for kids to see how well they're progressing with meeting those goals. Kids are more visual learners. They need to see themselves progressing in a chart or some way that they can see themselves meeting those goals. Um, examples of appropriate physical activity for children include moderate or vigorous aerobic or cardio training, um, like running, playing tag, swimming, playing a game of basketball with their friends, attending martial arts classes, as well as bone or strength training activities. Um, climbing trees, obviously with supervision. 
Um, playing on the monkey bars, doing push-ups, doing sit-ups can all help contribute to that 60 minutes of physical activity a day. If children are hesitant or resistant to that physical activity, we've got a couple tips for you. So the first is, like I mentioned before, make it fun. Don't treat physical activity like a chore. Um, instead, it should be an opportunity to have fun and move our bodies. And it's especially helpful as kids get older to incorporate their family and friends. Um, for example, have, their child, have the child's birthday party somewhere active, like a park, rather than somewhere more passive, like an arcade. Um, you can also build that activity into an already established routine. So taking the stairs whenever possible, um, keeping things upstairs, parking in the back of the parking lot just to increase the movement throughout the day rather than relying on that, that close parking spot or avoiding the stairs, taking the elevator or the escalator because it's fun. Trying to get them moving just as a normal part of their day. Um, another opportunity we have is cell phones. The cell phones are portable. We can walk around with them. We're not tied to one place. So if we're on the phone, catching up with family and friends, especially in light of the pandemic when we aren't seeing people, you can take that cell phone on a walk with you and make it a fun family activity where you're walking and catching up with grandma or whomever. And lastly, consider active hobbies like gardening or dancing to replace some more of our sedentary activities, um, such as video games. Okay, and that transitions us into lifestyle changes and, and uh, the recreational screen time. Stacy talked about the, the, the screen time, the changes that happened when kids went to virtual learning. We have some kids in virtual learning right now. Um, we're in and out of that. So um, non-academic recreational screen time is what we're looking to limit to two hours a day. So those are things like streaming Netflix, social media, video games, things like that, where they're sedentary and, um, and doing things to entertain themselves with screens. So we, we do wanna look at limiting that to, um, to two hours a day. Uh, sleep has been tied to, um, or not enough sleep has been tied to overweight and obesity uh, many in many, many studies. And so having kids have good nighttime routines so we can set them up for um, routine sleep times, wake and sleep. I know during the shutdown, some of these, and adolescents particularly, um, can quickly move into flipping day and night. And so trying to keep them on a, we sleep at night and we're awake during the day. And uh, the more we make that a normal time to get up every day, the, the easier it is to keep that routine. Um, sleep is so important too, because if, uh, if we're tired in the morning when we wake up, we probably make bad choices, right? We, we want to hit the caffeine and, and the sugar and that kind of thing to just try to get us going. Um, but we make a lot better decisions when we get enough sleep and we have more energy. Um, and, and the hormones that are affected when we don't get enough sleep contribute to overweight and obesity as well. Um, Mealtime routines, we've sort of um, already hit some of these things, but we wanna make sure that we're not in the clean plate club anymore. I talked about appropriate serving sizes and, and getting the right size plates, but whatever we put in front of our kids, we wanna make sure that um, they eat until they're full and we wanna help them recognize those cues. So if they're pushing that plate away that they're done, we're not gonna force them to, to give us this clean plate. Um, we want to avoid skipping meals, so getting in a, a regular mealtime activity. Um, snacking, like open snacking, open kitchen is not a good idea, but you know, an after school snack that's a, a healthy protein and, and maybe fruit, veggies kind of thing is, is a great way to do a snack. And then, um, and then the kitchen closes till dinner time kind of thing. So um, I know with, with the pandemic, um, and shutdowns that that's been a problem for all of us that the kitchen is is kind of open 24 7 so so maybe making you know kitchen hours kind of thing um, if we can do family meal times we can do improve so many outcomes for our kids but a big one is um, slowing down that that eating time uh, helps kids again to recognize those cues when they're full um, we get to connect find out what we ha what our day was like uh, learn more about each other. Um, we also want to involve kids in those uh, meal planning. So wherever possible, and I, 
I know that uh, we're all very busy, but if we can find a time during the week, it doesn't have to be at five o'clock when you get home or 5.30, um, we wanna be planning that meal ahead of time because we're tired, the kids are cranky, and now we're trying to figure out what's for dinner. So if you can find a good time on the weekends or something, and maybe you take the kids to the grocery store and you try to stay to the outside of the grocery store where those fresh foods are and, you know, make it a challenge for the kids. You are planning Monday night's dinner and you're planning Tuesday, et cetera. Have them, have them pick some obscure uh, vegetable or fruit and, uh, and then you can get them involved in finding recipes and, and actually helping prepare that food. Um, so again, like I said before with nutrition, we want the whole family making these changes. Um, so even if you only have one child in the family, that's maybe pushing that overweight or into obese. We want everyone eating this way. It's good for all of us. So um, let's see. And then the last thing I just wanted to say too is, you know, I remember growing up a lot of times, you know, that clean plate, you know, if you eat your dinner, you get dessert, right? So we want to really be careful about using food as rewards. So think about other things that are good rewards. Kids, kids can be motivated by a sticker. Um, and sometimes just small little things. Sometimes as adults, we think of these grand reward kind of things, but definitely we wanna stay away from rewarding uh, kids with food. So maybe it's an extra trip to the park that week or something like that. Um, or maybe they have some choices of what, what is a reward for them. All right, so now we're just moving into some resources. I've um, picked out some local uh, resources that we have, and Stacy's going to hit on a few um, virtual resources as well. But I think um, when I was trying to think of some good places to connect, the parks, um, our Fort Wayne Parks and Recreation, and certainly our outlying communities have great park systems. Our county has a good park system. Um, so you probably aren't too far from a park wherever you live. And uh, one thing I just want to say is parks don't shut down in the winter, surprisingly, right? Um, they do shut down the bathrooms, so you have to plan ahead for that. But uh, with the weather the way it is, you know, we can, we can ask Alexa or Google or look it up on our phone and, um, and just kind of figure out what layers do we need and prepare for it. And, um, you know, getting outside and getting that exercise is just so good for our soul and... Um, and our health, so, um, and our mental health as well. So uh, I walk almost every day through Lakeside Park and I see families out there. I see kids on swings still. I see a um, ice skating rink that they put a temporary ice skating rink. I see kids out there on skates. I see kids out there just sliding across the ice, having a blast in their boots or gym shoes or whatever. So there's lots of great things to do at the park. Um, if you have a dog, bring the dog along. They that's a good way to get your kids running and moving around too. So good for both. Um, also, the parks has indoor programming as well. We have after school programming at uh, multiple sites and there are classes um, that you can, you can find those online or if you get those uh, Fun Times magazines to your house, um, they have like art classes, cooking classes for all different age groups. They've got uh, soccer, dance, gymnastics, STEAM classes, all kinds of great stuff for kids to get them more active and um, learning things, meeting new people. Um, another resource, uh, Parkview has a community greenhouse. This is over by their Parkview Randalia campus um, on Beacon. And while it's not open um, because of the pandemic right now for classes on site, they have virtual programming. And you can do, they have all kinds of interesting cooking classes that you can, can do via Zoom. They, um, they also have resources if you wanna grow a garden. I know with my kids, when they were younger, we, well, I still do a garden every year, but you know, it's something about kids learning where their food comes from and how to grow food. And it, it's a great way to get them interested in different vegetables and, uh, and you can plan the garden together. and. Again, this greenhouse is a great resource uh, for getting started with that. And the library, uh, the library has great programming. Um, right now they have a lot of virtual programming. Um, like you can do an escape room virtually, something you could do with your kids, although I know that's probably recreational screen time. 
but something you know you can get get your whole family involved with um, but they do have in-person programming that'll be coming back and a lot of times those involve active things but it gets them out of the house and um, there are also our librarians are great resources if you're looking for those special cookbooks and and that type of thing or books on different activities that type of thing so so great resource there um, the Y the Y has great programming um, they have pools at um, many of their sites uh, they have lots of kids classes um, and that type of thing as well so and I know some of the local gyms too. So if you, as a, a parent or caregiver, you go to a gym, check and see, they might actually have a program for kids or maybe they have childcare that does some active things with them as well. So lots of great options and resources in our community. And then I've got a couple I want to highlight these last two websites. Um, they're both from healthychildren.org, which is actually the parenting website from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So there are over 60,000 pediatricians who are members of this website who kind of vet these resources. And they're committed to just sharing education and these resources that focus on the optimal health of children. Um, and they focus on all stages of life, starting in infancy all the way up to young adulthood. Um, the first page is a direct link to their nutrition homepage and that is a great place to start. It houses a ton of additional resources related to appropriate children and nutrition. There's all kinds of articles that are in plain language. They're easy to read, easy to understand, um, and they can you can kind of follow those links and it'll jump you around throughout the web to get you some really interesting nutritional information. And then the one right underneath that is about MyPlate. So MyPlate, if you guys remember, used to be My Food Pyramid was our food guide that we used for how many servings of each of the food groups we needed. But my plate kind of simplified that down into a picture of just a plate. And so it takes it and makes it a little more transparent across meals, how much of each plate should be dedicated to grains and vegetables, um, fruits and protein and dairy. So a child can look at that picture and say, hey, half of that plate is our grains. So half of each plate of my meal should be grains. And this is a really good way for parents to start this education with their children and hope that they can take it forward and use these resources even when parents aren't necessarily around making their plate for them. And then we do have a reference page for anybody who wants to look us up and make sure we're giving you accurate data. All right, thank you. We can go ahead and move on to the question and answer. So if you do have any questions, please go ahead and type it into the chat. Um, to get us started, I did have one question. Um, I've noticed, and I'm sure other people have noticed as well, that when you're in the grocery store, um, the unhealthy processed foods tend to be cheaper um, than the healthier foods. Um, do you have any tips for families that are on a budget of how can they, you know, provide these healthy foods without necessarily breaking their budget? Great question. I think um, when we're in that produce section, if we're looking at like the pre-packaged foods, so salads that are so great and so easy to just grab and mix together. But if you can kind of figure out like, oh, I really love this Asian one. Like, how can I put that together? And maybe you buy just the bag of coleslaw and you mix it with some of the pieces and you can get the bottle of salad dressing and, and that type of thing and put those kind of together and they actually tend to last a little bit longer too. But, but going with the whole vegetables is often a better deal to buy, you know, the carrots whole or the, the uh, salad in the head of lettuce, even though it's maybe not the most convenient. Um, and let's see, what else? Do you think? I think you hit on earlier kind of shopping the perimeter of the food. I know that doesn't help as far as the cost goes, but that's a great place to start if you're on a budget and you know you have 40 bucks to spend on this trip starting around the perimeter is going to get you full of healthier foods and you'll be able to kind of budget your money as you go. Um, and then that kind of limits when you get into the middle aisle where the Doritos are housed. If you've only got, you know, two dollars left and Doritos are three it's it's a lot easier to say no to those Doritos unfortunately but we I mean that's something I mentioned we did see the pr cost of food is rising and unfortunately the cheaper the food is often the less nutritional value it has so keeping track of a budget trying to mm -hmm. buy larger quantities like she said the head of lettuce versus the one serving side of salad might 
actually be similar in cost and then obviously looking for coupons and just trying to lower those costs in any way, but starting on the perimeter and focusing on the healthy foods. Sure, <laughs> and kind of tying into that, um, where does it come in with like organic versus non-organic, particularly if you're trying to stick to a budget? Um, is it okay to maybe go with non-organic bananas as opposed to the organic ones or anything like that? <laughs> That's something I can't, I can't is, answer yeah. that for you. I think yeah, it's I definitely just, a personal yeah. preference. I, sure. I would agree. I would agree for sure because I know that I've never really ridden the wave of the organic foods, but I do know that, you know, what you see is the information you see about it is that it's probably more nutrient dense and that type of thing but yet it's still better to be choosing that the dull bananas over the you know yeah, the, the little squirty uh <laughs> applesauces that probably have a lot of extra sugar in them and that type of thing or buying the big thing of unsweetened applesauce and and you know maybe adding a little cinnamon to that instead of the the sweetened big jar of the you know cinnamon sugar stuff and there's just a lot of those things. If you can buy sometimes in bigger quantity, put them into smaller containers. Um, we can get we can get a bag of brown rice really really um, uh, cost. That's a low cost, uh, or a big um, uh, tub of oatmeal. You know, if you, if you buy them that type of way versus the little packaged oatmeal. So again, if you can take that time on the weekend, or if you work evenings, maybe mornings or your time or wherever it is and try to plan those meals ahead as much as possible. I know it's difficult. I, I was, I'm a mom of four uh, girls, but they're all grown now. I still have one at home, but I do just remember how crazy some of those nights were and, and that my kids did lots of sports and so many evenings we weren't home and, and just trying to always figure out what, what can we have. Uh, but those family dinners too, I just think they're just so important. And, and it, you know, if you don't do it now, Maybe you just pick one night a week. Maybe it's Sunday nights are your time where you protect that time, and then you can build on that to make better, you know, just move towards better habits. Also, um, we know that uh, we can develop a habit over about six weeks. So if we kind of work and just set a goal of like, we're just gonna commit to six weeks. Maybe that's something that's a little bit more doable or a couple weeks at a time and you just make baby steps. but. When you can change your habits for six weeks then, or change your, your, your practices for about six weeks, you can then roll it into a habit typically. I think another thing too that I wanna address with that that we didn't put on our community resources page is the farmer's market that we have here. We have such a great farmer's market. It goes year round. Um, and I think that's a great way to kind of bring those foods more local. Hopefully they're less processed. They're, if they're not certified organic, they're closer to organic and that helps with, you know, we do know there have been a lot of job losses, a lot of furloughs. And if we can keep that money here in Fort Wayne, keep it local, we're getting healthier foods for all of our families as well as boosting our, our local economy by fundraising for the people who grew it and, and fed us. And mm -hmm. that's something that it's, it's very easy to find. Fort Wayne has a ton of farmers markets and they're, they're great. I know the they move it indoor during the winter, so it's not like a, a dead time in the winter where you can't you can't find a farmer's market with some some fresher produce anyways. Sure, for sure. Um, you had mentioned that there were critical periods of development and um, you had mentioned like, for example, um, when women are pregnant. Are there any other critical periods, for example, maybe adolescence or something else that we should be kind of um, keeping an eye on or? I think Jennifer mentioned, you know, the majority of our growth happens both during infancy and during adolescence. So I would consider those critical time periods where the nutrition that we're getting during that infancy stage and during the adolescent stage is really important in how our kids grow. Um, if they're going through that huge growth spurt in adolescence, we know they generally grow taller. So if we can get them the good nutrition, they're going to go tra grow taller instead of wider. And infants, where their brains are continuing to develop, they're developing rapidly in that first year. So focusing on good nutrition, healthy fats in infancy, and like Jennifer mentioned, the breast milk and safe infant feeding will help them to develop strong, healthy bones, brains, and hopefully prevent these problems of childhood obesity later in life. But I would definitely consider infancy and adolescence critical periods as well. And just today I read an article and I, I missed mentioning it earlier, but 
about the study they did with preschoolers and they did this I intervention with them on um, healthy lifestyle things, including activity and diet and that type of thing. And they did it in a school setting with them. And what they found was this group was so, this group of kids at this age, preschool age, so three to five, was so receptive to this message that they saw changes in their knowledge, their habits, their attitudes. But what's really cool is they took this home and their parents started making changes because these kids are saying, oh, I want this, or let's go outside and play or things like that. And so the parents actually were influenced by the kids and they said uh, that it was more of an influence that way than if the parents were doing the intervention with the kids. So again, this early intervention, early identification, I think is so important because as these kids get older by the, the data that we have, it's just like, the chances of them not having these risk factors as adults is is start to is really lost if we don't catch it early. So, and then I have one other question. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis, especially in this day and age, on body image. And I know when I was growing up in you know the late '90s and early <laughs> aughts, kind of dating myself here, but um, you know there was a heavy emphasis on body image, and sometimes it tended to go in the opposite um, unhealthy direction, um, what tips do you have for parents who want to promote a, um, healthy eating, healthy um, activity, but also don't want to get it to the extreme where their child feels like they need to do extreme dieting or anything like that? That's a great question. Yeah. That's a great question. And I know um, one thing that's, that can be helpful is really focusing on what their body can do mm -hmm. and what, what maybe this extra weight makes it hard for them to do. And so it's more about function than it is about appearance, but it certainly is a huge piece of this whole thing that we really kind of glossed over. It's a whole nother, the mental health pieces, and Stacy touched on some of them, but, but it definitely, we know that uh, we have this epidemic of depression and mental health um, uh, problems right now across the lifespan. Uh, definitely in our youth, and this definitely plays a part in it. We know that chronic inflammation that with the obesity, like I mentioned, actually contributes to depression, but but it's it's not that it's not just as simple as move more, eat less, make better choices. You know, there's so it's a very complex issue, and so so we've tried to bring some pieces here, but certainly, yeah, we we're not gonna fix every everything, but I don't know if you have I think more. that's, I mean, especially, I mean, I'm at teenage, teenage girls is immediately what my mind goes to. And if, as a teenage girl, had my mom looked at me and said, hey, you really need to start working out more. You really need to start, you know, I would have immediately taken that personal and probably spiraled and screamed and thrown a few fits. Um, so I, I can feel for parents who are trying to kind of broach this subject with a little, you know, they, they want their children to be healthy, and I think that would be my best advice is, like Jennifer mentioned, focus on their health. Focus on what they can do rather than what you look like or what clothes you can wear. Focusing on, you know, the long term, the healthy aspect of it. And how do, how do you feel? How does your body feel when we're at our adequate weight? All right. Well, thank you so much. I know I definitely learned a lot um, tonight. Um, if you are interested in other uh, University of St. Francis lectures, um, we will be having one one per month um, during the spring semester. Next month, um, Michael Cahill will, pu will be presenting um, Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast, and that will be on Wednesday, February 16th at 6.30 p.m. Um, and then, like I said, if you're interested in this program or any other um, ACPL programs that we offer, um, you can see what we have coming up um, on our events page, um, which is on our website, which is www.acpl.info. Um, and the events tab is at the top of the page. Um, right over there, we just click that. You can select which branch or location you would like to go to and see what they offer there. If you have any follow-up questions or comments regarding the information shared today or are in need of additional resources, please contact us at, at ask at acpl.info. And on behalf of Stacy and Jennifer and the Access Fort Wayne um, folks here, thank you for attending today's program and have a good evening. <laughs>